two, two, one, two, two, two. One, two. This is a public announcement. Will Michael Halpin, that's Michael Halpin, please visit the Sony stand. Thank you. The next session on the live stage is starting in five minutes' time. This session is being led by Keith Bernstein, so please make your way to the live stage for the next session, which is starting in five minutes. Thank you. and we took the doors off.
One, two, one, two. One, two. Why is it always one, two? Should we do it? Yep. Are you going to... Just go right straight ahead. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. I know there's a lot of shiny stuff out on the other side here, so I appreciate you giving up your time to come and hear this. Um, the job that I do now is as a film and TV stills photographer. And when I tell most people that's my job, they have one of two reactions. They either say, I didn't know that was a real job, or they say, why don't they just take the stills from the film? The answer to the question is, it is a real job. The answer to the second question I'll come to later in the talk. But if you've seen ever any pictures in magazines, newspapers, and in particular in posters, then that's the job of the film stills photographer. So this is just a small selection of some of the films that I've worked on in the past. Coming up to the top left, the most recent being seasons five and six of The Crown. So the job of the film stills photographer is to do all the publicity, promotional, social media pictures on any film and TV production. And those pictures get really widely used. So if you've ever seen a photograph in a newspaper or online review of a film or TV program, an interview with an actor, anything behind the scenes, those pictures will have been taken by a film stills photographer. The first section of the talk that I'm gonna do is not about film stills, but it's about what I did before film stills. But when we come to the film section, all the pictures that you see will have been taken during the shooting of the film. None of them will have been taken as special setups or after the event, they will have been taken while the filming was going on. So this is the work that I do now, but our job didn't start that way. And for more than 20 years before becoming a film stills photographer, I worked as a freelance photojournalist. And there were two stories that I covered in particular in 90, both of them in 1994. And the pictures from those would have a really profound effect 15 years later on my career, although obviously at the time that I took the pictures, I had no way of knowing that. And this is the first of the stories. And this is the end of the Civil War, 1994, the end of the Civil War in Rwanda, Central Africa. And at the end of the war, the borders opened and people fled from Rwanda into the neighboring country of Zaire, looking for some sort of safety and some kind of freedom. And the UN estimate that about 200,000 people crossed at this particular border point between Rwanda and Zaire, crossed in the space of three days. And they crossed over into Rwanda, uh, sorry, into Zaire, in a very small place called Goma. And when they got to Goma, what they were hoping to find was some kind of shelter and refuge. In fact, it's a very small volcanic town, had a tiny little airport, which at the time was only good as a, as a military airport. It couldn't take civilian flights. And there was almost no shelter and nothing for them there when they arrived. And one of the consequences was that there was a huge outbreak of cholera, which spread very, very quickly. As I said, there were no facilities there, so people that died were left out in the open. And one of the key things to remember about 94 is this is obviously pre-digital. This is all shot on film. And working primarily for news and magazines, one of the key elements was that your pictures had to get out of the situation you were in very quickly, which in practical terms meant that your unprocessed film had to be shipped back to wherever your office was, in my case in London. The film had to be processed, edited, and then physically duplicated to make different sets of pictures, and those pictures then had to be couriered to magazines and newspapers. Really time-consuming. So a lot of your time as a photographer, unlike now, was spent purely with the logistics of getting the material from where it was back to an office where it could be sold. If it got back too late, as news pictures, it had no value. And I was in Goma for three weeks, and towards the end, they managed to enlarge the uh, runway, which had, has just been for military planes. 
They brought in some big earth movers. By then, there were so many people, so many displaced people, and so many dead bodies that they ended up dumping a lot of them into open pits like this. And because these were essentially news pictures for me, as soon as I'd shot them and they'd been published and distributed to magazines, and then a couple of months later, the original material would be returned to me, I couldn't see any value in the pictures whatsoever. They'd served their purpose, and they went on all the jobs that I did, they went into a box in the corner of my office and into a cupboard, and I never looked at them again. They'd served their purpose, and they had no value for me. So I didn't think about these pictures until they came around much later. So this is 94, and the second story that I worked on at this time was the election of this man. So this was the first democratic election in South Africa. It's obviously Mandela. And for two months in the run-up to the election and voting day, I was in South Africa and I covered his election, uh, the process leading up to his election. And again, one of the key things, because there were so many photographers there, so many news crews, one of the key things was to get your material out very quickly. And photography for me really reflects the time in which you're working, not just in fashions and how things look. But it wasn't possible to get the film processed in South Africa and transmitted back to London, so we had to send unprocessed film. And the way we did it, usually, was to go to the airport in the early evening when most of the flights would go from South Africa back to the UK. We'd give a Ziploc bag of unprocessed film canisters to a passenger in the queue and say, would you mind taking this back to London for me? And a courier will meet you as you get off the plane at Heathrow. And I think there was only one occasion out of many that I ever had a rejection where somebody said they didn't want to do it. Usually people were quite excited about the process, wanted to know where they would see the pictures, when they would be used, and they would take them back. The idea of that happening now, although you don't need it with digital transmission, the idea of that is crazy. The other thing about this time, 1994, is that access to things like an election procedure like this, was really open and unrestricted. And a South African election is nothing like a British or American. It's almost like a carnival each day. People turn up in their thousands. There are restrictions. So this is at a speaking engagement. The two gentlemen on the left and the center are his personal bodyguards. And you could, because they got to know you after a period, you are traveling with them all the time. Access now without being an official photographer or a sanctioned photographer would be just impossible. And at various times, just to show the difference in the period, was that Mandela obviously was electioneering for two months and he was crisscrossing South Africa continuously. And sometimes if he saw us waiting and he had another speaking engagement a little distance away, he'd take us on the helicopter with him. Without any checks, without any security, Obviously, that would never in a million years happen now. It was a very, very different time. But again, as soon as the pictures had been sent into a box, and I didn't look at them again. And it was, I carried on doing this kind of work all through the 90s and into early 2000s. The time that I photographed him, he was by now a very old man. He had the beginning of Alzheimer's. He had come to Cape Town to meet some people. And we did this, did this picture of him. This was the last time. And then there were picture stories for really for all the magazines and newspapers. And again, this reflects the time. So this is a prison that it didn't stop people from offending. But again, I was let in at six o'clock in the morning. I was there until the prison shut at night and I was given unlimited access in a way that just wouldn't be possible now. I don't necessarily think that was a good thing because the prisoners almost had no say in whether they were photographed or not. That would be different now. So I'm not saying that was a good thing, but it was just a reflection of the different times. And I carried on with this kind of work. A lot of the stories were sort of lightweight, some of them were heavier. But sort of 2000, 2001, 2002, digital technology began to arrive with cameras. The result of that was that the magazines and newspapers discovered they could spend a lot less money on photography because it was much easier for them to get pictures. So the work declined quite rapidly. And about 2002, I was kind of lost. This work had almost stopped completely. And I was unclear what to do. I'd left school at 18, hadn't done anything else, so I'd never trained for anything else. And I sort of wandered around photographically for a couple of years without much direction. 
And then it's a sort of sliding doors moment and a lot of people think the photographers have a clear career path and know exactly what they're doing. And that's true, but to an element on the side, it's like a kitten playing with a ball of wool. Things happen and you just cannot expect. And one day I got a phone call from a friend of mine who is, was and still is a film publicist in South Africa. And she said she'd just started working with a British film director on a new series that was going to be shot in Botswana. And she thought, because I'd photographed Africa a lot, and a lot of African women in particular, I should come and show him some pictures. And the series was the first adaptation of this book, Number One Ladies Detective Agency, and shot mainly in Botswana and a little bit in Cape Town. And this is where the pictures from Rwanda really came back for the first time. So I went to see the director, Anthony Mangello, a very famous director, he had just won two Oscars. And I showed him some pictures. One of the pictures was this one, which was from the period in 94 when the refugees left Rwanda. Hadn't done anything with the picture for all the years in between. And Anthony liked the pictures and said he'd hire me to do the stills on it, which was going to be a long job, 16 weeks. But because of his stature as a director, I thought that I had to say something because I was going to be discovered if I didn't. And I said, I haven't done film stills before. And Anthony said two things which sound a little in the context, but they both had a huge impact. The first thing he said was, don't worry about shooting film stills, just shoot what you see in front of you. And that kind of made sense to me as a photojournalist because that's a lot of what it is. You arrive in situations where you're not particularly clear about what's going on and you make it up visually as you go along. And the other thing that he said was when he stepped onto a film set in the morning, he treated it completely as real life. Even though the sets were wobbly and people were having makeup and costume put on, to him the moment that he stepped on was real life. One of the other pictures I showed Anthony was this one. And that's also, that's from a few days later in Rwanda the refugees had moved from Goma, which had no protection from them, and then moved into a rainforest area, which they thought was safer to sleep in at night, offer them a bit more protection. And early in the morning, they'd come out of the rainforest and look for food, medicine, whatever, further on. So what that picture appears to show, a kind of image of great beauty, is really the exact opposite, but that's one of the first pictures that I showed him. And the reason that I put that there is that we started shooting number one ladies and one of the first pictures that I took on set was this one. And to me there isn't a great deal of difference. There is a difference because we've got a huge HBO production with trailers, actors, hair and makeup, catering, all those facilities set against the situation in Rwanda with almost nothing. But in terms of what I was doing as a photographer, for me there was no difference. One of the good things about this job one of the terrifying things was that this was the very first job that I'd shot entirely digitally. Catch on, so I was shooting everything both on film and digital at the same time. Digital cameras were a little bit fundamental then, rudimentary. I had a EOS 20, which was not very good, but was one of the early digital cameras. But this was the first job that was entirely digital. That was good. The bad thing was that Anthony said he'd like to see the pictures every two or three days, which if I'd been shooting on film would have been impossible. So I knew that either I was going to get fired or kept on, but he liked the pictures. And in particular, I think because I was new to a film set, I had visited film sets a little bit before for newspapers to do a sort of one-day piece with an actor, but never really spent time on a film set. I became really fascinated and stay fascinated by the whole circus of what goes on with a film set and not just the scenes that are photographed. So this is some of the lighting crew setting up the lights. And it really is a circus. On a small film crew, we might have 200 people. On a bigger film crew, some of the epic ones, there can be 350, 400 crew members before you even start with actors and extras. So it, it really is a kind of traveling circus. And one of the mysteries about film and TV is I get a lot of questions asked, how do I get a job in it? Not just as a photographer, but doing sound, camera, hair and makeup, whatever. The answer is until you get your first job, it's a complete mystery because the jobs aren't advertised. It's a kind of strange world that seems hidden away. As soon as you get your first job, it makes sense because everybody who works on the film is in the same position that I was. They know that period of work is a number of weeks, but then it's coming to an end. 
and everyone is looking and talking about what's coming next or they've heard about what might be happening. People are very generous, unlike newspapers and magazines, they won't tell you anything. In film and TV, people are very generous about passing on. So I did a number of films living in South Africa after this one. And then one day I got a call to be interviewed about a film that was being made in South Africa, shot in Cape Town and Johannesburg. And it was to meet the producer, this man's producer, so this is Clint Eastwood. And the film was this one about the 1995 Rugby World Cup, Springboks winning Mandela, presenting the prize to Francois Pinar, Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon. So Morgan Freeman obviously playing Mandela, Matt Damon playing Francois Pinar, the Springboks rugby captain. And I got hired and this started two things for me. The first was that it started a nine year working relationship with Clint Eastwood. So I ended up doing eight films with him in a row, missed one, eight films with him. But the second thing that it started was the type of film that I was getting hired to do. And with only one exception, which I'll come to later, all of the films I got asked to do were filmed in quite a realistic way. I know that the caveat to that is that behind the scenes there's a huge production, a lot of money being spent, trailers and facilities, but when it came down to the filming of the actual scenes themselves, they were quite photojournalistic. So this was a day when we went out to our actors, they were all local kids. They'd been told the day before, meet here because someone's gonna come and play rugby with you. And Matt Damon and the other actor up. This was All Blacks against the Springboks and they're standing on a plexiglass screen. The camera obviously is underneath them shooting up. So that takes quite a lot of time to set up and organize and get right and light. But most of the filming was done in a very kind of realistic way. And that, as I say, that set the tone for the films that I'd get hired on with the exception of one that I'll come to. But alongside the filming, there's so much stuff that goes on that never gets seen and it forms, if it doesn't get used as publicity pictures, it forms the archive for the film and TV companies. And this is just one, Morgan Freeman had just received his first Blackberry mobile phone and neither he nor Clint had had a mobile phone before and knew how to use it. So that was just off to the side while the lighting was being changed for the scene. So things like that happen all the time on the side of the set. And again, going back to the early pictures, black and white pictures of Mandela on the election trail, that led to me being hired again in South Africa to shoot this film, which was Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. It's his story and Idris Elba plays Mandela from a, a early teens through to the old man as president all the way through. It was a long job, 17 weeks, and it was shot all over South Africa in some fantastic locations. A lot of it in the Eastern Cape where Mandela was from, such as this. But then part of the film was shot on what's called a sound stage. And a sound stage is really nothing more than a soundproof warehouse. In the case of this one, this was in Cape Town. And what you're seeing here now with the wooden circular structures and the oblong structures is the entire sound stage, but those are different individual sets within the stage. So there's five or six sets there. You might, if it was a particular big set, the entire stage will be taken up. This is broken down. And when you see them like that from the outside, just made of bits of wood, they don't look very impressive. But if we come down into the first set, which is at the bottom of the frame there, that's what it looks like on the inside. And directors, producers like to shoot on the stage because it's completely controllable. They're not dependent on light or weather. And the other thing that they're able to do, and again, this is one of the things that I love about film sets, is the collaborative nature. Is there are a huge number of jobs that if you've ever been to the cinema and you've got up before the credits have even sort of got a third of the way through, you'll have missed plastering, set decoration, painters. So in this particular set, you can come back two days later and it's been repainted and redressed as Idris's prison on Robin Island. And the work of those people, which really never gets credited properly and never gets seen, is something that really interests me and I think makes the job so valuable. And one of the other things that I love, is, which is exactly what makes producers and directors get gray hair early, is the unpredictability of filming. And what you're looking at here, this is Cape Town Film Studios quite near the airport. And this is a full-size set build of the prison 
courtyard at Robin Island where Mandela was imprisoned. There's nothing actually on the other side of that structure, but that's, that's the courtyard. And this was going to be a, what they thought was going to be an extremely difficult scene to film, and it's where the prisoners would be taken out of their cells in the middle of the night, strip searched, usually in kind of rainy or cold weather as a way of sort of terrorizing them a bit, and then sent back to their cells. So you had a lot of difficult elements. It was winter when we did this, it's cold. You had rain, electricity for lights, and actors, so a lot that could go potentially wrong. So there were two days of rehearsals. And even during the day, these were some of the extras who were playing the other prisoners. It was cold for them. Only looking back how so many things connect photographically. And this picture started something without me knowing it, which I'll come back to towards the end. So during the day from a water tanker offset, the crew there in wet weather gear, trying out the lights, making sure everything is safe. So that's what it looks like when you see it in the, at, although the rain machine itself doesn't look particularly impressive, when you see it as a scene in the film, that's what it looks like. And we started at about eight o'clock at night and there was a 30 minute break between each take, each setup, because the courtyard in the film has to start off dry, then the rain starts, the prisoners are brought out. So the courtyard had to be dried off between each take. Prisoners, uh, the actors rather, warmed up, brought out again, but we did about four takes of it, and by about midnight, it was finished, and it went without any hitch whatsoever. So something that could have been really problematic worked really easily. And the opposite of that, and the things that I really like, are when things sometimes don't go as well as you planned. And this scene is a perfect example. This was going to be a reconstruction in the film, A Long Walk to Freedom, of a very famous speech that Mandela gave just before voting day. And he spoke on live TV in South Africa. Most South Africans didn't have TV, and South Africa hardly ever had live political broadcasts. It was a huge event. And people who didn't have TVs gathered in clubs, pubs, restaurants, bars, anywhere that they could watch a TV to hear the speech. And what the producers found was that the original studio that Mandela had used in 1994 had been closed just after his broadcast and mothballed. They'd moved to a new premises and they'd left behind the old TV lights. A lot of the cameras and equipment were there. We just had to reconstruct the set and the background, but a lot of what was needed to make the scene look authentic was already in place. So that seemed like a very easy scene to shoot because everything was there. In fact, what happened was, because the studio hadn't been used since 1994, everything worked apart from the air conditioning. And we were using the old TV lights, they're nothing like the LEDs you're seeing now which give off almost no heat, the old TV lights. The result was Mandela was wearing a lot of prosthetics, pieces of latex on his face to make him look older and a bit heavier. As soon as he came into the studio, his mixed pieces peeled off the sides of his face. So this is his hair and makeup artist and the two prosthetic technicians at the beginning trying to stick the makeup back on. Whatever they tried didn't work. The studio was extremely hot. So after a couple of hours of trying it and stopping and starting again, they decided to stop and they sent a driver back to Cape Town. He got two portable air conditioning units, put them in the studio. The studio cooled down. They'd redone Idris's hair and makeup, perfect. And we were just about to shoot and I took a very nondescript picture of Idris. But as I took it, it reminded me of something that happened 14 years ago and the different worlds of photojournalism and film stills completely came together. And in 96, Mandela made a state visit to England. A uh, three-day visit, and I followed him everywhere, and he did all of the things that happens on a state visit. He met the Queen. Remember him? He met the Prime Minister at the time. He gave an address to the Joint Houses of Parliament. And on his last day of the three-day visit, and bear in mind he's now an old man, the last day of his three-day visit, he gives an address from the balcony of South Africa House in Trafalgar Square, very sort of symbolic position. And then he goes downstairs into the basement, the press center of South Africa House, and there's a press conference there. 
and I take this picture, and it's a nothing photograph, really. There are thousands and thousands of sort of headshot pictures of Mandela. I've taken lots of them myself. It's got no context or background to it. Nothing special about it. The picture was never published and never used. But if we fast forward back to the Idris and the makeup, that was the picture of Idris just before we started filming. And this was really where the two completely disparate worlds totally come together and end up as one. And I carried on with doing pr principally film. But the first real TV production I worked on was this one, was season three of Game of Thrones. And the reason that I put this in here is that Game of Thrones, along with other things at the time like Sopranos, really changed the kind of template. TV before had been low production, low budget, not particularly big name actors and directors. And Game of Thrones, along with some of the series, Breaking Bad and so on, we know them all now, really started to change that. And it was a huge production series for Game of Thrones, but some of the actors, Amelia Clark, started off their lives in Game of Thrones, not particularly well known, maybe only known to a few people, but they really ended up as quite big people, big name people working on films and TV. They got the best directors to direct it, cinematographers, production designers, so the whole balance between slightly cheaper TV and big expensive film began to change. And with HBO's money for Game of Thrones, they were able to do some extraordinary things, and this was one of them. This is a very pretty little fishing act with tourists most of the time. HBO closed off the ramparts for three days. They did two days of preparation to lay down the sand that you see there, and also to build the crosses. And the one thing that they were really paranoid about was any leaked photographs getting out of the production or the set before they wanted them released. So they managed to close this whole area off, filmed the scene. But one of the great things I love is that however much money you've got, there's always unpredictability that even with all of their expertise, they can't do anything about. And just as a quick behind the scenes, even when you see many of the leading cast from Game of Thrones, Ian Glenn on the right, Amelia behind him, and they look so heroic and magnificent, if you just take a step behind, they're actually standing on fiberglass rocks in front of the crew. And I said earlier that the film set, the Invictus set the kind of template for the kind of films that I'd get hired to do, so back again to Clint Eastwood, and this was American Sniper, which was shot mostly in Morocco, a little bit of Bradley Cooper playing the lead. And again, a lot of the scenes that we shot were very, very unstructured. Maybe do one or two takes. Clint doesn't give people sort of clear direction that you have to go there and go there. He just sets the framework, which as a photographer means you have a kind of free reign, as long as you don't get in the way, to shoot almost anything. So there were pictures that I was shooting here, and when you shot them, Anthony's words kind of stayed with me that he treated it as real life. Clearly, it's not real life, because it's Bradley Cooper and Clint Eastwood and everything that they bring with them. But when you're the photographer taking the pictures, all of that vanishes, goes into behind the scenes, f you forget about that, and it just becomes about the photographs. And the same was true for this one. This is a private war. It's the story of the Sunday Times journalist Marie Colvin, who was killed. And the director who was hired, Matthew Heinemann, had never directed a feature film before. He had won an Oscar two years before for a documentary that he had made. And a documentary crew might typically be six or seven people, one camera, very lightweight, very quick. And suddenly Matthew was into a huge film, 300 crew, a lot of uh, We shot this in Jordan. Some of it was shot in London, but most of it was shot in Jordan but he brought with him all the kind of documentary sensibilities. So a lot of the people that he used, uh, the gentleman on the left and right, were locals from villages that he found during the pre-production period. They weren't actors. And for scenes like this, this is Rosamund Pike who plays uh, Marie Colvin. He'd gone to the village a few days before and got local women, probably none of whom had ever seen a film crew before, 
but he managed to bring that kind of authenticity, a documentary authenticity to the scenes. But again, as a photographer, because it's not particularly structured, it's a fantastic thing to shoot. You have such freedom to work on it. And again, going back to one of the first questions, why don't they just take the stills from the film? Well, they can, and sometimes they do. They're called screen grabs. So if it's not possible to get the particular still photograph they want, they'll take it from the film. They don't generally do that. But there are thousands of uses and moments away from what the film camera is shooting, where the actors might be just on their own, hair and makeup, the production, the camera department, the camera, the film camera is only looking in one direction. The stills camera has got to cover everything that goes towards making the whole film. And I said earlier that it set the template for all of the films except one that I've worked on. And this was the one that was very different. And this again is Clint Eastwood and this is Sully. And it's about the Airbus that landed on the Hudson River, New York. All of the passengers got out alive. And clearly we weren't going to land another Airbus on the Hudson River. So the film was shot in three very separate sections and locations and then put together. So it was kind of the opposite of everything that I'd done before. So the first part of the film was two weeks on the Hudson and they just filmed obviously without an aeroplane but just the rescue boats, the craft at the back there which you'll see again in a later picture. So all the kind of big cast scenes were filmed there. Then we moved to the Boeing training facility where all of the scenes that you see with Tom Hanks and Aaron Eckhart, the co-pilot, they're in the cockpit and you see New York skyline out the window. Everything was shot there using the green screen. So then all the elements from the two weeks in New York, the skyline, the water that you see is put together afterwards. And the final bit of this whole kind of composite is this. And what you're looking at is the back lot of Universal Studios in Los Angeles. They have a water facility, sometimes filmed Jaws there, lots of other films have been made there. And that's a real Airbus, and the Airbus is sitting on a hydraulic platform, which can be tipped up and down to simulate the landing on the water and also left to right. But to save money and to save space, on the right you'll see one of the rescue boats, but that's just a dummy one which has been cut in half. So they didn't need to bring the New York boats there, they just made little half boats, which you don't see. And that's the plane with, again, the half rescue boat, and it's sitting on the platform just below the water. And the blue screen, which does the same thing as a green screen, effectively, the blue screen, is so the camera is looking in this direction. When it goes into post-production, the New York skyline will be put there, and then that's flipped over with a crane to shoot in the other way. So there were no single moments where you could get the entire thing together. That's the lighting rig, so the camera is on the other side, inside the plane, looking this way. This is the start of the rescue, so the passengers did genuinely come out onto the wings, climb into these rafts, but that's when the film cuts and the filming that was done in New York is then brought in. And actually the only bit that was in effect real was inside the plane all the passengers go out of Tom Hanks obviously coming down to check that nobody's left behind but as he comes down the engineers tip the plane down into the water so that the plane begins to fill up so it starts off obviously dry and then as he's coming down to check there's no one left behind it fills up then when they cut call cut and Tom goes out they tip the plane up the other direction all the water rushes out again So what you see here are the two posters. Obviously neither of them were possible. So the one on the left is a four-part composite. So I knew when I was shooting it that nothing was going to happen that would be a, really be a single image that would stand as a poster. So on the left you've got uh, an outline of the airplane window from inside, obviously. Tom shot in New York. Water, I did lots of pictures just of water at different heights, different levels and then a little bit of sky. And those four things were put together to make the poster. And the same on the right. Obviously, the rescue scene did actually happen like that, but a lot of elements were taken away. New York skyline, New York water in the front.
And I get the comment a lot from people that don't go on to film sets. They say, my God, it must be so exciting. And the answer is, it isn't. A lot of the days are very, very routine and very mundane. But I find them always interesting and always fascinating. Just the process of it and the collaboration of the whole team. But there are a few days, and there have only been a few, that really stick in my memory as being extraordinary. And on this film, J. Edgar, it's Leonardo DiCaprio playing the FBI chief. This was one of the days, and the scene from one of the days, that really stayed with me. We were shooting some in the studio in the morning, and this was the back lot, which is left permanently as a kind of New York tenement. It's used by different companies. Clint Eastwood just having a drink. But then in the afternoon, we went into a very small hotel room, and it was to do this scene between Judy Dench, who plays DiCaprio's mother, and DiCaprio, obviously. And it's a scene, D DiCaprio's unmarried, and she's worried about him, and she wants to encourage him to loosen up a bit and have a girlfriend or a partner. And he's very resistant to it. And it was a really small hotel room, didn't need much redecoration. And the film itself is not that great, but this particular scene, which goes on and on, is really good. And it's incredibly intense and uncomfortable scene to see. In the end, she encourages him and says, the one thing you've got to do is learn how to dance. You'll never find a female partner if you can't dance. And although he resists, in the end, she persuades him to dance. Now, that's what you see when you see the film. But if you turn my camera around the other way, that's what they're acting in front of. So there you have director, boom swinger for sound, uh, key grip, who adjusts the camera, director of photography, camera operator hidden, focus puller and head electrician. And normally, of course, I'd be on the other side. And so this day, when they acted this whole scene really intensely in front of so many people in this tiny room, really stayed with me. And earlier on, I pointed out this picture, not because it's an exceptional photograph, but it started something for me that leads me kind of up to date now. And these were some of the extras in the Long Walk to Freedom. And this was the first film that I'd worked on. Nearly every film has extras, but this was the first film that I'd worked on that had a huge number of extras. We'd sometimes have 500 people a day for big crowd scenes. And I became really kind of intrigued by them and fascinated by them. They put up with hugely long hours. They don't get paid very much. They don't get treated very well. Uh, and I started photographing them on Long Walk to Freedom, separate from the production of the film, without any kind of idea. But it's carried on. And now, on just about every film that I've worked on, this was a series called The Nevers. I've become really intrigued with the extras. A lot of them I've got to know well because they're professional extras, and in fact, they're now rebranded themselves and they're called supporting artists. You're not allowed to call them extras anymore. And they appear on different things. They're talking to you about films they've wo worked on and programs they've worked on. But they do spend most of their time waiting for the call to set. So they'll get there earlier than we will. They'll stay till the end. And often they spend no do nothing all day, except rest somewhere without a trailer, without any comfort. And I've really built up thousands of photographs now of the extras, and they've started to be exhibited. They were at the Royal Academy a couple of years ago. They're now in a gallery in Brighton. And it's something which just kind of started without any plan or foresight and just le led on. And these three pictures that I'll show you bring me kind of up to date and really cement for me the fact that there's no difference between photojournalism and film stills when it comes down to the photographic side of it. And this, and this picture, and this one are from seasons five and six of The Crown. So The Crown is the last thing that I've worked on. It's occupied the last 18 months of my life. Season six will be out at the end of this year. And the reason that I'm ending with The Crown is because it really brings together the fact that there's no difference. Before I get to the end, I just wanted to talk a little bit about equipment. I don't want to do too much about it. This is a scene from The Crown. This will be in season six. The reason that I put that up there is that five or six years ago, this picture wouldn't have been possible for me to take. So here we have the metadata. If you don't know what metadata is, put your hand up. 
This is the me metadata is a very small digital file which attaches itself to any digital photograph that you take, whether you take it with a phone or an expensive camera. And you don't normally see the file. You can see it if you want to, but it's normally hidden. But it's a digital notebook of exactly where and when you took the picture, the exposure that you used, the lenses, and so on. It's always there as a perfect record, and you can, with any type of software, call up the metadata for any picture so that you know how it was taken. So this is the metadata for this picture, which wouldn't have been possible five years ago. So at the top, I don't know how clearly you can see it, the top red circle, it's a 70 to 200 millimeter lens. The aperture is 2.8, so the lens is wide open as it can go. And the shutter speed is a 15th of a second. So already on this, I shot maybe 30 frames. Half of them, there was too much movement. And it, so a 15th is about as low as you can go before you're not going to have any success. But below that is the ISO, which is at 8,000. And that's, for anyone of my age who grew up shooting film, that's the ridiculous figure. So if I go back to 94, you're shooting color slide film. You would shoot with a 400 ASA, might be a fast film, ISO. You could do what was called push the film, which meant you could ask the lab to process it for longer and or at a higher temperature to effectively make it more reactive to light. But you couldn't go beyond pushing 400 ASA, maybe a stop and a half, which would give you 1,200, 1,200. Beyond that, you couldn't go because the film degraded, you got grain the size of ice balls, and the colors began to shift. And this is with Sony AR5. I use Sony cameras and Sony lenses. This is AR, uh, AR5, and that's at 8,000 ISO, a figure that was completely out of the realm of fantasy. You wouldn't even have thought about it. And probably, if we come back to this in three or four years' time, 8,000 will seem archaic. And in fact, if you use Adobe products, either Photoshop or Lightroom, there are two new releases the last couple of months, AI releases for them. And one of them in Lightroom is a, a section of the program that will remove any noise, any grain completely, without affecting the image itself. So that almost makes ISO redundant. The other bit of equipment relates to the question of if you're shooting during the take, why doesn't the sound recorders pick up the sound of the camera? And the answer to that is this. Or the answer to that was this, actually. And this might look like something out of a museum, but this is a camera blimp or sound blimp. And they were used unchanged for about 50 years. I used them until about seven years ago when I changed to mirrorless. And the sound blimp, the camera sits in the back. The camera is connected there. You close the blimp up, and you have just two controls, autofocus on the sh bottom button and shutter release on the top. And the other thing that you can do is change the tubes for different lenses. The lenses rotate and grip the inside of the lens so you can zoom. But apart from that, once the camera is inside and the scene has started, you can't open the back of the camera, because if the actors see you doing that or hear you doing that, that's probably going to be the end of your day on a film set. So you were stuck, and you would view through the back. I shoot everything manually, so that means that if the scene moved from a bright area to dark or vice versa, I'd have to wait until they'd done a second take because I couldn't adjust the camera, couldn't get inside to adjust it. And these were made by a small company in LA called Jacobson. They've just gone out of business a few years ago when Mirrorless came in, but they worked fantastically well, and they were standard, also used by uh, golf, snooker photographers, tennis, and in some of the courts in America where they're allowed to film. But then mirrorless came along and that changed it completely. So the mirrorless cameras, Sony, Canon, all of them now have a silent option completely. So that need for being discreet has changed. And the other thing that's changed, of course, is that you can make all the adjustments through the viewfinder in real time. You don't have to wait for a scene to end. And I'm just going to end with what I've been working on, as I said most recently, was The Crown, seasons five and six. And the reason that I'm ending with this is that, for me, this is where any distinction between real life and fiction goes. And if you read anything about The Crown, season five, huge amount of publicity. Was it a documentary? No, it isn't. It's all made up. But there were elements within it and days within it that were real. So. 
This is the Winds of Fire. Now, this is reimagined. We know the Winds of Fire took place. There are pictures of the library. This was a set build at Elstree Studios in North London. They built it and then set fire to it. So we know that the scene, the set looks authentic, but there are no pictures of when the Queen visited. There's one picture of her arriving at Windsor Castle, but there's nothing from inside. So we don't know that she and Philip ever came into the library together like this. That's imagined. But we do know that the Prince William had his very first day at Eton signing the register, accompanied by his mother and Harry. And we know that it looked very, very similar to this. This was not shot at Eton, but was shot in a school in South London. But there are lots of pictures of this, so we know that this is authentic. Uh, Jonathan Price, Imelda Staunton, and Claudia Harrison playing Princess Anne. Who knows if they're who knows if they ever had dinner together? I don't know. And if they did, did it look like this? No idea, because there are no photographs, so that's imagined. And we also don't know that Leslie Manville playing Princess Margaret, did she spend her life slightly portrayed as a sad and lonely figure watching TV alone with her dog? I don't know if that's real or not. But there were days that we did which we know are accurate, and this was one of them. This is a reconstruction of the Martin Bashir BBC interview with Diana. And this is from our reconstruction, but we know that it's accurate because there were BBC photographers there at the time who took pictures very similar to this. For reasons of copyright, the Crown were unable to recreate it identically because some of the items they couldn't get access to. But we know that the look of it is pretty authentic. And finally, this one. This isn't my photograph. This is by a Daily Mail photographer, but it's a very famous image. It's lodged in a lot of people's minds. Just after the announcement of the separation between Diana and Charles, Diana goes to the opening of the Serpentine Gallery in London one evening in Hyde Park, and she wears this dress, which has come to be called the Revenge Dress. It's a famous dress. It's now owned privately in Scotland. It's got its own Wikipedia page, but this image and a number of others very, very similar and very iconic. But when we came to redo the scene, that's what it looks like. So we weren't able to copy it directly because the, uh, to reproduce it directly because the dress is copyrighted, the jewelry is copyrighted. But for me, there was no difference if I had been that photographer there at the Serpentine that day when the uh, separation was announced, be no difference in taking this. And that's where I'm going to end it. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions, be really happy to answer them. If not, come up and speak to me afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody wants to ask the first question, I know. Oh. <laughs> Have we got a microphone? Have we got a mic? We've got a mic. Bring you a mic. Two, one, two. There we go. Okay. So I, I, I didn't quite get the feeling of you're, you're on the set. Do you have a, at the, at the start, does the director say, look, this is what we're going to do, Keith. Uh, we're going to do this, this, and this. This is where I think the best photo opportunity will be. You should stand roughly over there and so on. Or is it just Keith strolls up at the start of the day and just does his thing? It's the latter. In fact, I've been on some films where I'm, uh, I mean, film... Shooting a film takes a long time. A short film, very cheap film, might be six weeks, but a long film can be months. Some of the Mission Impossible films are shot over a period of years. I've been on films for weeks where I might not have exchanged more than three words with a director ever in the entire time. Most of the time, they've got a thousand bees in their head. Every day presents a million problems they've got to answer, and the last thing they need is a photographer saying, what do you need from me today? So you have to make it up, but that's also the great part because they're tied up with other decisions and other problems and you're kind of left alone as long as you don't commit the cardinal sins of getting in the way or obstructing something or making a noise. You're left alone to shoot really what you would like to shoot so it's without any kind of direction. There are a few directors who Clint Eastwood couldn't care less about photographs or publicity or promotion he doesn't care at all about it. There are some directors who've been a little bit more hands-on. Anthony Minghella was one of them. But generally, they don't pay any attention to anything that they don't need to. Okay. Uh, 
kind of following on from that, do you get a chance to take some of the stars to one side if they're on a break and do and have any kind of more setup shots, or is it all grab as you can? Uh, it's generally grab as you can. I mean, I generally you can try and do it, if, particularly if you build up a relationship over a period with them. I don't like doing it because they do their job, which is the acting part, and then they might go off, and I kind of feel uncomfortable breaking that slight bond. Some of them are quite happy to do it. I mean, Imelda Staunton, for example, on The Crown would always suggest, because she had fantastic costume every single day, she'd say, oh my God, don't I look wonderful today? Let's go and do a picture. So she would kind of initiate it. But that's very rare. Mostly they don't. There are days that are kind of, where they, which they call special days, where you might set up a small studio similar to these ones here. And, but that'll be built into the call sheet. And the other thing is that the one thing you can't really do is take an actor away because their time is so kind of structured. It's a 10 hour working day and their time is really structured. And if you were to take somebody off just even for five minutes when they were needed for a rehearsal or a makeup check, that would just be a, a terrible thing to do. So generally, no. What is the hardest um, when you've had to film or you think, you know, you could adjust it a bit or...? In terms of the actors or the film itself? In the film. I think Sully was the hardest because nothing there was... There was no single day which looked like it would tell any part of the complete story. Because the plane didn't exist on water. Yeah. When it did exist on water, it was in, in a, effectively a big lake. Uh, so I think that Sully was the one, and I, it wasn't a film that I should have done really because there are other photographers I think that do that kind of green screen and special effects photography much better. But I got what's asked the, to do what, it because I worked. the one you got most satisfaction out of? Uh, Long Walk to Freedom. Oh yeah. I really enjoyed and The yeah. Crown I really enjoyed even though I'm not a sort of great watcher of The Crown as a series. The locations were always great. The costume was, it was a very sort of, spe each day was a sort of spectacular day. Yeah. And so that was kind of an exciting thing to be a, yeah, a small part of and to witness. Oh, yeah. Cool. That's it. Oh, gentleman here. Hi. Um, do you get access to like the storyboard of the film, or do you just get given an idea, kind of idea of what the scenes are going to be like to uh, have an idea to position yourself? Or? It varies. Some directors have a storyboard, and they usually put it up at the start of the day. Uh, it, I don't find it particularly helpful because even though they put it up, it doesn't pay any attention to where lights might be positioned or precise camera angles, but it gives you an idea. But you get what is called, at the start of each day, you get a thing called sides, which is a little A5 breakdown of the scenes of the day with the script in it. And that comes from the old theatres, where the theatre actors used to stick up the script on the sides of the walls, hence the name. And that really gives you the breakdown of what's going to be done during the day and the sequence of it, and that lets you figure out. But it's just much more of a collaborative thing that if you speak to the cinematographer and the camera department, the people you have to watch out for are the actors, the camera department, the sound department, because those are the three that are always going to be on set. And as long as you speak to them and kind of discuss or listen to them when they're discussing what they're doing, you can kind of figure it out. The worst thing you can do is to wait and wait offset somewhere until the scene's just about to start, because then you won't have any idea of exactly where they're looking and what they're doing. Thank you. Okay. That's it, we're done. Great, thank you very much.